Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Great. <laughs> Did you have a good time last night? Excellent. One, two good. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome um, to all of our mayors and business leaders to this plenary uh, breakfast. First, I want to thank uh, all of you for helping make this a successful year through your support of the conference and the Mayor's Business Council. I want you to know that I understand how challenging these times have been for so many of you in the business sector. As important as the public sector and public sector jobs are to our cities, the most important thing we must all do is promote policies that help keep and create private sector jobs. I believe that we're all in this pool together. The paradigms have shifted, and we need to start working together for the good of the economy of our country and for the jobs of the people that we both serve and our constituents of ours, those who are your employees and those who are our citizens. So these are constituents that we share together. And together, we must work to ensure that the jobs stay in our country, grow in our country, and expand in our country. When mayors talk about green jobs, we know that most of those jobs come from the private sector. When mayors talk about investing in sustainable transportation, we know that the private sector will help build that infrastructure. So please, Help us continue to find ways to innovate and save money for our taxpayers and to provide better service. And please support our federal policies, priorities that will lead to stronger cities in the days and years ahead. You see, I believe that when we work together, and start bringing the brain trust of mayors and CEOs to the table, we will have the solutions that we can bring to Washington. I also believe that when we work together, we will have a critical mass and a bigger voice. So we need to begin this kind of discussion, and we need to begin to work together for the good of the people we serve. Thank you, Phillips, for sponsoring this breakfast. And let me introduce the CEO of Phillips Professional Luminaries, North America, Zia Eftakar, whom I have met this morning, and... Uh, is going to be my very good friend. <laughs> Mr. Eftekar is a highly respected 40-year veteran of the lighting industry. He is currently CEO of Philips Lighting Group and uh, single largest business within Philips Professional Luminaries. By introducing new business service such as the Energy Service Group, and meaningful techno technological innovations and reflects the demand for energy efficiency lighting. Mr. Eftekar has continued to keep Philips Lightelier at the forefront of the professional lighting solutions. It is, challenge, it is a challenge he now welcomes in a larger scale. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Zia Eftekar.
Thank you very much, Mayor Kotz. Um, that friendship, I'm sure, is going to have some, some ramification. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, the, as a new sponsor of your uh, annual meeting, and also as a new member of the Business Council, it is, it is a great honor to be able to talk to you this morning, the distinguished audience of not only the mayors of our uh, cities, but also my business colleagues from different industries. What I'd like to do is, uh, begin, before I begin my remarks, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Philips by showing a short video. If I may have that video run, I would appreciate it. Across North America, in our homes, offices, cities, Philips technology is shaping the future with innovative lighting, healthcare, and consumer lifestyle solutions that transform the way we live. A diversified health and well-being company focused on improving our quality of life, providing almost 25,000 jobs for people in more than 150 U.S. cities. Dedicated to energy-efficient technology, healthy lifestyles, and reducing the environmental impact of its products. Carrying us forward and fulfilling our brand promise with sense and simplicity. As you saw um, in the video, Philips is focused on health and well-being. And our uh, three businesses, lighting, healthcare, and uh, consumer lifestyle, are linked together with what we do with respect to product innovation and the products that we bring to market to improve people's lives. In lighting, our uh, guiding principle is simply enhancing life with light. And that's central to everything we do. This is most vividly uh, demonstrated by our global leadership position in lighting and by um, new technologies that we bring to market to optimize energy efficiency and energy conservation. Now, I'm talking about energy conservation, and we all recognize the implication of that. And while in recent years new codes and regulations have been enacted to improve the energy efficiency of products and also reduce energy consumption, most of that has been focused on new construction. And while that is extremely important and what we need to do for the future of our energy policy, the reality remains the fact that most of buildings in this country, by some two-thirds by, uh, by the most recent analysis, are buildings that were built at least 20 years ago. Those buildings utilize lighting technologies that are not the state of the art and not efficient to the level that we need today in, the, in this uh, environment. We, um, we, of course, need to also be cognizant of the fact that most of the populations and most of the, uh, most of the homes and businesses and commercial buildings reside in major metropolitans throughout the country. By, um, by all recent uh, demographic studies, indications are that some 50% some of the world population live in cities. And by 2050, that number is going to grow to 75%. In this country alone, that means an additional 15 to 30 million people living in the cities. And of course, we are also all becoming more aware of the impact that we have on the, on the environment and the, in, the impact the environment has on our lives. So it is, it is with all of that as a background that our industry is experiencing a major, major paradigm shift. New forms of innovation and product leaderships are emerging, and new businesses are being created through the LED revolution. That's from addressing the urbanization with LED, creating lighting that is not only comfortable but much more effective and energy efficient, to how people live in their homes and how lighting can enhance their lives through color as well as comfort. These investments, these uh, advancements clearly are taking to a new area of demand from lighting. And of course, cities want to make sure that their identities 
are, are essential to a part of how they position themselves uh, for not only their citizen, but attracting additional citizenry to those cities. Over the next two days, my colleague and I hope that we have an opportunity to talk to you about some of these issues and its ramification on the cities that you are managing. I hope that all of you uh, will join me and the distinguished panel of mayors this afternoon at 2.30 in the special forum lighting the way to a more energy efficient city utilizing the EECBG funds. This workshop will, will highlight how mayors can meet their city's requirements with respect to energy goals, save money, and improve the livability of their cities. And throughout this event, you will find most of us right uh, on the first floor in, um, in uh, Phillips uh, Cyber Cafe. Please join us, uh, aside from uh, being uh, Wi-Fi enabled on there and having some nice refreshment and comfortable uh, seating. We would very much like to show you some of the latest advancement in LED technology, not only with respect to sophisticated system, but also even a simple replacement for the regular incandescent light bulbs. The DOE, with respect to the regular incandescent light bulbs, the DOE, late 2007, essentially challenged the industry to create a, an LED light bulb that would replace the existing 60-watt light bulb. According to the Department of Energy, this was an urgent uh, initiative because there are more than 4.4 billion sockets in this country that use that regular incandescent light bulbs. I am very proud to tell you, as of now, Philips is the only company that has submitted that invention and that creation, which was incidentally selected by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 inventions of 2009. This light bulb, <clears throat> this light bulb will replace the regular incandescent that all of us are familiar with and the nice light that it generates, which is very comfortable and wide. The difference is that this light bulb only utilizes 10 watts of energy. That is equivalent to 80% savings. Just you can very quickly calculate that by 4.4 billion. It's a staggering saving for the, for the country. It is a staggering saving with respect to environmental implication. That is really why we are so excited about the LED technology. The way we see it, ladies and gentlemen, the technology to enable us to get to our energy conservation goals are here right now. We don't have to go through tremendous inventions to get there. It is here right now. Clearly, the desire to achieve that goal is here now. I think it is, we believe, it is time to take very bold action and enable that change. And we also believe that that change can only come as a result of a private-public partnership that will enable this country to move to the next plateau with respect to energy efficiency. Again, it's been an honor to be here, and we are very much looking forward to seeing you later on in the forum as well as in, uh, in our demonstration area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eftekar. Mayors, I encourage you to uh, stop by the beautiful and functional uh, cyber cafe and networking lounge provided by Philips. I stopped in twice yesterday. It's beautiful, very comfortable, very white. <laughs> I was thinking, good thing there are not a lot of little children running around <laughs> because it's wonderful and it's downstairs by the ballroom. Now I'd like to uh, recognize and call our CEO and Executive Director Tom Cochran to give a few remarks and to introduce our steering committee and co-chair. Tom? Thank you, thank you, Madam President. 
I hope the light doesn't turn on when I'm up here because it's just too much damn light for this early in the morning for me. <clears throat> welcome. <laughs> uh, welcome to um, our business uh, count. Let, let me just say that uh, there are some people here that uh, when you look back and how we, um, th th it wasn't too long ago we didn't have a business council. And I think, um, I remember one day Mayor Daly said, where's the business community? Where's the business community? And Mayor Abrams and Mayor Ash, former presidents, were very supportive in, a, in us creating the business council. You know, I would go to the governor's meeting and y'all would all be there. And uh, I said, what's going on over here? And they said, well, they have corporate followers. And I said, well, what, is it, what do you charge them? <laughs> See, the business guys really liked me. We didn't charge them anything, but they were eating our shrimp. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so so um, I said, something's wrong with this picture, self. So I came back and called the staff in. And if, I said, if they can charge 15, hell, we can charge 10. Right, Jerry? And I thought that's what it was then. And within, within two weeks, we had 70 members. We now have 107. And it's so much, it's so important. Um, it's so important for what we do. Uh, right, just right here, you see, did you hear him say energy block grants, right? He said energy block grants. Well, we decided one afternoon in my war room that if we got a community development block grant, why can't we have an energy block grant? And that was when President Bush, too, was still in office. And so what happens is when you, when you have a stream of funds like that going from the energy department into our cities, Mr. Aftercar, we, you, we need to call on you to help us get these block grants renewed and with Congress and with the White House and what have you. So it's all about working together to do what we need to do to keep our economy strong. Um, we know uh, that um, we know uh, we know that the metro economies drive drive our nation, and um, and again, it was it was Mayor Abramson of Louisville that gave us that message when he said, "What I do in old Louisville affects three counties in Indiana." So when Jerry Abrams was making the metro area of Louisville, which went around into Indiana, he was helping the governor of Indiana. And so we learn from him, and, and we have our metro economies, we have our metro economy studies that go on. So we can talk about, we can talk about that, and then you have King County in Seattle. We have Undersecretary Sims here today. Uh, King, King County in Seattle marketed that region using the Cascade mayors, the Canadian mayors, to the Pacific Rim. So um, when we... Um, when we continue to bring the business community together, um, we're, not, we're not tin cupping, we're not begging, we are driving this nation's economy. And so I think the, Mrs. Couts, she's, she's from Burnsville, Minnesota, but when you go to Burnsville, Minnesota, it's a lot of business community there. And so that's in her DNA. And so we're talking about doing some different things with CEOs. So anyway, I'm up here today to uh, thank you, uh, thank the business. Council, and I'd like to recognize our 10 new members, and I'd ask, like to ask you to stand, please. Uh, America's Natural Gas Alliance, which is our title sponsor, uh, Global Traffic Technologies, I Control Mobile Payment Solutions, Microsoft Corporation, Philips, Ramsell Corporation, ROMMachine.com, the John Buck Company, the Link Group, and Vacant Properties Security. And I'd like to thank our platinum partners. And you know what platinum means. It means they give a little more. <laughs> Aclara, Amer American Management Services, DuPont, Lineberger, Gordon Blair, and Sampson, Nationwide Retirement Solutions, Pareto Energy, Walmart Stores, and Waste Management. And, when I, and, I, and I, I'm not joking about that. I just thank you so much for of what you provide for us to keep keep the, my lights turned on and 
and to help me do what I love to do more, and that's serve cities and mayors. So thank you very much. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, we're now at 107 uh, business council members, and I would like to thank all of you because it's budget cutting time for everybody. And, um, and so uh, a retention is a big thing right now. It's, only, it's a big thing with our members, but it's also a big thing with our business council. And I said this when we have a meeting uh, with the business council two weeks before every annual meeting. And I, and I, and I thank you profusely for staying with us because I know uh, we, when we have economic downturn, sometimes things go, and, but you have stayed, and, and, and thank you so much. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the co-chair, uh, Dan Gillison, from National Director, the National Director of Sprint for Remarks. Dan? Good morning um, to the, uh, the mayors, distinguished guests, and uh, the business council, and uh, my peers. Uh, as Tom has just mentioned, it is uh, uh, about us working collaboratively and partnering together. And with that statement, what I'd like to talk about real quickly is uh, this is all about partnership. And a great partner that I've worked with is the uh, co-chair, uh, Lucinda Crabtree. And as I uh, bring Lucinda up, I'd also like to thank her uh, uh, partner in life and her husband who has been there, who many of you all have met at the conferences uh, because he's been a great collaborator and partner too, and that's Stu McMichael. And Stu, thank you for everything. Lucinda, thank you for your collaboration, and I appreciate you. Um, with that, I'd like to have Lucinda Crabtree come up and speak. Well, I'm supposed to introduce Lucinda Crabtree. <laughs> come, come on. Lu, uh, you know, we, we talk about, uh, bi come, please, we, we talk about uh, business, and uh, we, we talk about big business, and Mrs. Couch says small business, and small business has been a thing. And so um, she is a small business woman. 12 people. She, she runs a, she's, run, she's 12 people. She, she runs a graphics. You know my newspaper, U.S. Mail? Uh, I'm, I found her when we started the paper, I think it was 89. She spent three months with me working on our design of our newspaper. And uh, so she's, it's always, you've always been a very special person uh, to me for what, how you helped me. I just wanted to thank you for that. But thank you also for your uh, support. This is Lucinda Crabtree. Well, I'm tickled to be an Oklahoma City mayor, Mayor Cornette. Yes, there you are. Because I've been here before. I was born in Oklahoma, but I have not been back since I was six months old, and I was afraid I was going to lose my Oki status. <laughs> but I have another good reason, and that's because, Mayor Cornette, you are such a fine example of healthy living. We at Crabtree uh, started a co-op for... WIC, that's Women and Infant Children, called Help Me Be Healthy. And our materials teach mothers how to make sound nutritional um, choices for their children. And over 7 million brochures have been distributed to 35 different states and overseas and territories as well. And um, Mayor Kautz and Mayor Yule, who is not with us, and Mayor Nutter, you're in here somewhere, I know. I want to give a heartfelt thank you for allowing me to shadow you in your job every day and or for the, the times that I came to visit. Um, I heard while I was visiting your cities how important the jobs, jobs, jobs were for your people in your cities. The jobs created by the stimulus bill have been life-saving for many people and the jobs that will be created by the Local Jobs for America Act will be equally valuable. We, the members of the Business Council, representing all of America's private industry, are your partners and an essential part of this recovery. So involve us in your plans locally and engage us here at the annual meeting. 
it's uh, foretold that small business is going to lead the way to a recovery. And in support of your vision of jobs, 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 I'm announcing we have a job opening at Crabtree and Company. <laughs> so let's get this recovery going. I get a gift. <laughs> this is our, uh, it's for recognition and appreciate for your service is the is our steering committee co-chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Let's get a picture here. That to you. And I wish it could be a new car. But <laughs> in the old days, we gave them out. But. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I see. Thanks for that beautiful gift. Okay. Okay, uh, you know, I, I want to also congratulate our new co-chair, uh, Kim Winston, who's the Senior Managing Government of Civic Affairs at Starbucks Coffee Company. And uh, I also want to thank the steering committee. This, this is a group that works very closely with Jerry Powell and Judy. Where's, y'all stand up? I think everybody knows them. Thank you so much. For my, they do a great job. And I'll now turn the uh, program back over to our president, Mayor Couch. There you are. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lucinda, for your service. Thank you, Dan. You all have done a fabulous job with helping to retain our, or our um, business council through a, a very difficult year. So thank you very much for your service to the business council steering committee. And I look forward to working with you, Dan, as we continue to move forward, along with the newly elected co-chair, Kim Winston, from Starbucks, and the steering committee members in the coming year. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you a person who is very important to me and has been a mentor and also a great friend and that is our past president and my good friend, Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago, for some remarks on addressing challenges and creating opportunities in the new economy. Mayor Daly. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, to my fellow mayors and, of course, the members of the business community, uh, again, I'm very honored to be here and thank uh, Mick Cornette for doing an outstanding job. He's a mayor that uh, uh, understands the city and always improving the city and looking to the future. And that's what we mayors are talking about today. The challenges that we see uh, in our own cities, in our states, in our nation, is the uncertainty of the economy. And that really frightens most people. And I'm going to give them a number of examples. Uh, as you get out in the community, you'll hear about uncertainty uh, from all your voters. They are upset, they're mad, and they believe that government doesn't work. And they believe government is spending too much money and their lives are not improving. And they look at public employees as a, 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 a group of people who are getting extra salaries, better salaries, better benefits, and they're paying for everything. And that's what the reaction is. Uh, and like anything else, how do we mayors, and we understand that because we're on the firing line, very few governments, state and federal governments, are not on the firing line. We hear it every day, and we have to make the decisions that improve the quality of life. And so that when we look at improving education, and our workforce goes hand in hand, and generating jobs and growth in our cities are the key. It doesn't matter what size city you are, you have to generate growth in jobs, and it doesn't come from government, it comes from the business community. And that's where the issue is. And there is where the philosophy will change. Does government create jobs or does business? I believe business creates jobs. Government gives the opportunities. But many times government can stand in the way continually in order to create jobs in our cities, in our state, in our nation. And so that we know the effects of the global recession. It's continually, if you look at the global recession today, they're talking about Japan. When you take California, you take New York, and you take Illinois, you talk a lot, major, major states that have economic crisis. 
And if you look at, I think it's 46 out of 50 states have economic crisis. And we know that on a personal level because what is happening to cities because of state programs. And so what we have to do is uh, we know uh, that the times are changing. This recession is not a recession of the past. It's V, you know, we come out of it real fast and we create jobs. This is a restructuring. I firmly believe it's a restructuring of all the things that we believed in in local government and all the things we believed in our cities. It's a complete restructuring. It's not the old playbook of the last century we're going to use. We're going to look at that playbook and say, here's how we got out of it in the 90s or the 80s or 70s. Those are all gone and those are thrown away. And so if you don't realize the problems, and if you don't get ahead of the changing times, you stand still, and of course our cities uh, slowly, slowly deteriorate, and, and that's what, or states deteriorate, and that's what you see more and more. You always have to have a vision. That's one thing you have to have. You have to have some form of vision, because we mayors deal with constant problems on a daily basis. But at the same time, there has to be a vision for your city and what you want to accomplish. And just come here to Oklahoma City, they know what they want to accomplish. They're going to have a good business feeling here. People want to move here. Uh, they know no one's going to get in their way. That doesn't mean they're not going to be accountable. But this city has a vision. This state has a vision. And we can learn from the recession. Uh, and we have to learn from recession. If we don't, uh, then it's our, it's our fault. It's a failure of government. And we have to restructure government. I think government has to get smaller. I'm one of the, I, ha I think it has to get smaller. And every day I'm trying to shrink government. Then you have to set priorities. You have to tell the people, this is your priority. What is your priority? You can't have a thousand priorities. You have to be able to shrink government, be more accountable, transparent, an effective job, and you cannot do everything that people want you to do because you just don't have enough money. And we know that the, the people are angry, and they should be angry. Uh, because if you have worked all your life, and now you're unemployed, and you go to government and say, well, you're not poor enough, you can't get in that program. And if I'm in a training program for two years and I've not had a job, you're going to get frustrated. If your son or daughter that you sacrifice to go to college can't even get a decent job, can't get a decent job, then you see homes on your block are being foreclosed. You see people, overtime is being cut back. You better believe they're mad, and they should be mad, because that is not the American dream. I firmly believe that. And you have to take what they're upset with and be able to change it. Don't be afraid of it. They're telling you the truth, and to me, that's what we want. And so how do you create jobs? How do you really create new jobs? And so if you look at the emerging industry, and the emerging industry, whether it's the technology industry, financial, hospitality, healthcare, transportation, even specialized manufacturing, it gets down to refocusing your workforce and business. Business has to be a partner. If they're not a partner in your relationship, then they feel the opposite. They don't have to reinvest in our cities. They can go as far as they want. They can offshore more jobs than you ever realize. They don't have to do this. They have a responsibility, but they don't have to say, I have to stay here. Global companies are global companies, and more and more companies are becoming global. You take a technology company today. A lot of them have more jobs overseas than here because the business is overseas. And like anything else, you have to realize that. So when you take a partnership, and that's what we've done to the business community, and say you have to be the overriding factor uh, in our relationship in creating jobs. It can't be government, because government cannot create jobs. I believe it's the business sector that creates jobs. And that's why the Workforce Investment Council that we created, uh, that we basically brought uh, together business leaders, different sized businesses together, with government, especially education and city colleges and local government, and to really work together and you tell us what you need in the private sector. And then our training programs, our training programs, both federal, state, and local, have to come together and train people for a job. People raise their hand, Mayor, I'm sick and tired of training programs. I never get a job. Uh, it's maybe a permanent job. We should just say, why don't we just create a permanent job for the training uh, and, and realize that you have to have the business community there. So one thing I found out in examples sitting in an airport one day and coming back from vacation, a woman comes up to me and says to me, Mayor, uh, you know, I just got laid off at such and such a company. I have two or three, uh, three children. I live here, and, and my husband got laid off. Uh, my ex-husband got laid off. I can't get child support. What do I do? I went to college. I did everything possible. 
My parents are, are moving, with, I'm moving in my parents. What program is for me? And I realized it's called the forgotten middle class. People who worked all their lives, went to college. They're not poor enough to get in the federal program. They're forgotten. They paid your local, state, federal taxes. They made maybe 40,000, 50, 60,000. They got laid off. And then, and then I start researching and I found out most people got laid off in the last three years did not have technology experience. No technology. So they got laid off. They're great workers. They showed up on time. Uh, they were loyal to their company, but they didn't have the technology skills. And companies start laying people off. And so we came up with the idea of Chicago a career tech, of taking the word middle class, which a lot of people can't use today because it's not politically correct. I do call, I think middle class is the key to this American dream, that you succeeded to become a middle class person, uh, that you can independently own your own home and pay your taxes and send your children maybe the first time to college and, and, and really enjoy this American dream. And so we created the Chicago Career Tech. And what it is is a group of business leaders, first and foremost, came together and said, I said, what do you need in the private sector? You tell me what type of jobs. So how do we fund it? So like anything else, local government has to come up with money. So uh, we, we have leased many of our assets, and in the meter, parking meter assets we leased. We took $25 million from one of our funds and invested in the first class of Chicago Career Tech. And it's amazing. We, had, we quietly did this. We had maybe 1,000 applicants. We didn't, we didn't publicize it. And we selected 100, about 170 people for the first class. And all the participants receive a stipend and even unemployment compensation. Because we, we should make them poor <laughs> to go on a training program. I mean, that, that is amazing. But you talk to many of the programs, oh, you have to be poor. Sell your home, sell everything. No, I said, no, this is not what it is. We want to stabilize them. We want to keep them in their home. We want to be able to have, keep their investments. And, and so what we did is we selected 175 people. Uh, it's amazing. Almost half of them have a bachelor's degree or higher. Half of them, 50%. The age is 46 years old. Average age. And they work from 10, 15 years, or 20 years. It is amazing. And what we have accomplished now is a six-day work week program, which is unheard of in America, working six days. I mean, think of that. I mean, we mayors understand that, but most America doesn't understand working six days. And so what the program is is two days of training, not by government, and not by, the, it basically by private sector. Two days of training. Two days of job shadowing with companies who they're going to mentor with on the job. Then two days of community service. They go back into the non-for-profits in the community that, that doesn't have any expertise on technology and can help those non-for-profits. And, and that is the exciting area. We have more and more businesses that adopted it and guarantee when they graduate, they will get a job. A job in with support. And like anything else, the Illinois Department of Commerce and uh, Economic Opportunities has given us about $300,000 in innovation grant to support this because it's a whole new concept. Uh, I firmly believe that government alone cannot operate any program. You need the private sector and you need the not-for-profit to work with you to really operate and basically run these programs, and that's what we have accomplished. We firmly believe that in this process, I will be looking at 30,000 people to train or retrain. Why? I have to build a pool of talent in Chicago, a talent pool in technology, so that any company wants to locate or relocate in America, I'm saying you come to Chicago. Because the reason why it's talent, you can bring a company in, and you can say, okay, I'm going to bring this company. But if you, bring, if you have 20 to 30,000 people, you're constantly training, and they're, on the, and they're on the Internet saying, this is my qualifications. And a company says, I'm going to move to your city. And they say, wow, look at all the people you have well-trained. I don't have to train them. They can come to work with me tomorrow morning. Now think of that. And so that's what we're looking at. But at the same time, uh, have, get, t taking the responsibility of public schools is important because Focusing on education, the educators stopped, all of our educators, higher education, everyone stopped our vocational and technical programs. We said, we're all going to college. No one ever should work with their hands. 
No one should ever work with their hands. This is ridiculous. We're all going to college. So, of course, if you look at America, they close our technical and vocational programs. And that's why much of the offshoring is taking place. And they will tell you that companies, no, I can't get machinists, I can't get this, I can't get this field. So we're offshoring more and more jobs. So the Chicago Career Tech, we are basically saying that there are job opportunities for you after four years of high school in a career tech that you be able to get a job, go to night school, go to city colleges, or go to four-year college, at least you prepare for a job for the business community. And the business community would be happy that they can take a young person into their company and say, yes, I can give you a scholarship. You can start working here. We have to get back in believing that government and the business community can work together. And that doesn't mean there will be differences on opinion. But in the long run, that has to be the philosophy of local government. And I think many of you have that. I think I've, I've had the privilege of meeting many of you time and time again and to listen to your success stories and listen to the innovative programs. And, of course, I take them back and I try to implement them in my own city because of the mayors and, and the programs that you have that instill to, in me that leadership quality that each and every one of you have. And it doesn't matter what size city you're in, involved. And so, like anything else, we believe that we can create a lot of opportunities for high school career programs. We, we can't call them vocational programs. You know, that's politically unacceptable among the educators. Uh, you have to call them technical schools, or you have to call them apprenticeship schools. You have, to, you have to change the name, but it's the same philosophy, preparing young people for an opportunity for a job or going to college, uh, and, and a quality diploma. And that's what we looked at. This summer, we are online in our summer programs in education. Now think of that. We're online. We're not going back to the old philosophy. You have to wait till s September. So we have programs online for our students in th uh, 30 high schools in the city of Chicago in our libraries. And you can, you can go online and, and basically go through a course this summer and get credit for it and be able to take a test at the end. I mean, you have to have a revolution in education, and I think dealing with education and business has to come to that. We're very thankful. Uh, one thing we have done is the federal stimulus program. You have a lot of not-for-profits, philanthropic organizations and foundations. Everybody's competing against one another. What we said, we brought everybody into a room and said, listen, who is an expert in homeless? Who is an expert in job training? Who is an expert in early childhood education? Raise your hand. We're not going to compete against one another. Let's all work together. Government should be com competing against you. We should work together. We'd rather work together than competing and everybody loses out. And you only get a piece of the pie and no one gets all of it so we can really have an effect on the issue. And that's one thing we have done dealing with the, uh, the stimulus package. We have brought all the non-for-profits together to really work on behalf of what we see. But I firmly believe that most small businesses have growth, but when are they going to grow if the larger businesses have the uncertainty in jobs? And I have met more and more business leaders this year, than I think, than anyone else, and the uncertainty. When you have uncertainty in local government, when you have uncertainty in state and federal governments, they're not going to invest. There's too much uncertainty. What's the new piece of legislation? What's the new law going to pass? What am I going to do with my profits? Do I invest them in human services? Do I invest them in jobs? Or I invest them in my lobbyists, my lawyer? <laughs> I invest them in, in, in all the rules and regulations that government's going to pass. I sat down with our small business, and you tell me, all the problems to get a permit, all the problems to get a license. Then you find out that most, you, most of the uh, uh, inspections uh, are dealt with an inspector making an interpretation that's completely different from another inspector. We have found that out. We're going to consolidate all inspections. We're going to basically have a handbook and say, this is what you do, this is what you cannot do. And secondly, we educate anyone applying online for any license or permits and time requirements and put everybody under one roof and said, this is it. This is what the rules and regulations are. No one can interpret this differently every other week. And that's what small businesses want. Small businesses also want business. <laughs> How can you say, I'm going, to have, I'm going to help small businesses if people are not spending money and they can't spend money? And that is the issue. You keep lowering prices in small businesses, they won't be around because they can't afford themselves. And we see in small businesses is that many times people have to lay off people. They just can't afford 
the cost of government. I, I be very frank, and that includes even local government. It includes us as well. So and that's what small businesses are saying to us. You can't take my profits out. You can't take without me having hiring another person. The cost of government. I think that's what the issue will be. And those who understand it, if the voter are upset and you say, I disagree with you, and I'm going to fight you on a daily basis, you're going to lose. They're sending the message. You may not agree with it. You may differ with it. But in their message, there's some good things what they're saying, that I cannot afford these programs, or I can't afford your cost, your cost of government, or the cost of government local, state, and federal. And what they're giving us is a strong message. Let's respond, not in a negative way. Let's respond as mayors always do, understanding that and correcting it for the people that live within our jurisdictions and the betterment of the quality of life for our citizens. And I firmly believe that this business council does that for us. We, we, we have a relationship, and we're not afraid to talk about that. And our competition, and one day someone said to me, you know, we cannot compete Federal government cannot compete against China. The federal government doesn't compete against China. The business community competes against China. That's who competes. Our business people compete. It isn't the United States government competes against China, because they can't. We know that. But it's the business community, and that's what we have to understand, and we understand that, and what you see is a great success stories. I think anyone could be up here in my place telling about the success stories you have within your own cities, and to me, this is what it's all about, local government responding in a positive way in understanding what we can do in order to improve the business climate and, of course, better jobs for our citizens. Thank you very much. Well, you all heard it. We're all going to be working together. And Zia, I'm not the only one singing that song. Uh, rich, powerful message. Thank you. I think everyone needed to hear that. Mayors are serious about working together. Mayors are serious about really owning our businesses in our city and making sure that we continue to grow and keep jobs here. You've seen what uh, Mayor Cornett has done in his city with his renaissance. Uh, Mayor Daly talks about, I love that program. One of the things we do well here is that we share best practices and then we take them to our cities and we replicate them and put our own brand on it. And uh, Mayor Daly, I have a program in my city like yours, but I like yours better because you have the six days, two, two, and two. So two plus three. <laughs> Wonderful. So I think having them work and getting training in a nonprofit environment gives them the skill set and the experience. So that's a great, that's a great practice. So thank you, Mayor Daly. At this time, let me recognize a conference of mayors, trustee who is leaving office. Honolulu Mayor Mufi Hanuman is stepping down as mayor next month to run for governor. We just want him to remember cities when he gets to the governor's office <laughs> and work his executive office work with mayors. This action uh, that uh, Mayor Hahnemann is taking is required by uh, his state law. Otherwise, I know that he will continue to be with us as he runs for office. For the last four years, as chair of the Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, and Sports Committee, he has been our leader on tourism and arts. Mayor Hahnemann co-chaired our task force that supported the Chicago Olympic bid. It was under his leadership that the Travel Promotion Act passed Congress this year, which was a metro agenda priority for the Conference of Mayors. 
He has also played a majority role in seeing that the National Endowment for the Arts got a major increase in funding last year. For his work on both the national and local levels on the arts, he was awarded our Mayor's Arts Award at our winter meeting. Mufi, as you leave us, is Mufi in? There he is. <laughs> He's not standing up. <laughs> He's sitting down. So, Mufi, you need to come up here because as you leave us, your work has left an imprint, not only on this organization, but on cities and people throughout this nation. So, from all of us, we say to you, mahalo. I don't know whether I should uh, offer some remarks or sing a song. <laughs> but uh, let me just say a few words and, and a bigger indulgence, if I may. Um, as you know, I travel a long way to attend the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And as we all know, whenever we travel, we're often asked, is this really necessary? And in my case, since I come the farthest, to come to Washington, D.C. or to the summer meetings, um, I have to pass that litmus test at home. Uh, when I look back at my tenure as mayor, uh, this is probably one of the most meaningful uh, experiences and associations uh, that I have ever done in my professional career. Uh, I'm very, very grateful that I made the decision to be actively involved with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I'd be remiss if I didn't extend uh, one of my maxims of leadership, and that is the Mahalo principle, the thank you principle. I want to thank former Chair Wellington Webb, uh, who impressed upon me very early the importance of belonging to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, he told me it's all about uh, identifying best practices uh, for one city. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge Mayor Palmer, uh, who saw very early the importance of tourism and the arts, and when I pitched him that it should be part of the 10-point plan, uh, I didn't have to do much in terms of uh, ensuring uh, that he recognized it and wanted to bring it to this August body. I want to thank Mayor Riley. Uh, I tell mayors all the time, especially new mayors, you'd be remiss if you didn't take him up on his opportunity to go to his city uh, and to learn from one of the longest serving mayors in America about urban design and the like. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Mayor Diaz. Thank goodness he changed apes to tapes. <laughs> <laughs> I would have hated to be in charge of a committee that was all about arts, parks, entertainment, sports, hence the acronym APES. Uh, he added the T to it, and we became TAPES. Uh, and I will always remember that. Certainly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the gentleman to my immediate right, uh, and that is, of course, uh, Tom Cochran. Tom, I'm going to miss uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, but most importantly, Tom is the glue that keeps us together. Uh, I tried, uh, fellow mayors, to have a conference come to Hawaii. Uh, for one reason or another, we couldn't do that, but Tom knew that I wanted to do something in my city, and of course, we had the Asia Conference of Mayors uh, that came uh, to Hawaii as a result of that. I want to thank the members of the committee that I served with on tourism, arts, parks, entertainment, sports. You've been great to work with, uh, and certainly as we took up the clarion call to help Mayor Daly uh, to get the winning bid for Chicago. Uh, all was not lost because we worked together beautifully and certainly uh, that experience of seeing what it takes, real leadership, to put one city at the forefront, that's what Mayor Daly did. And besides, had I not been involved with Mayor Daly, I never would have got to sit next to Oprah Winfrey. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mayor Daly. <clears throat> I've got a nice picture of her now in my office. Um, then, of course, Tom McClyman. I hope, is Tom McClyman here? Uh, he served as uh, our secretariat, if you will, of the Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, Sport. Tom, you've been wonderful, and I know the next chair uh, will receive the same kind of service to you. And last but not least, I'd be remiss if I didn't let you all know 
that for the five years I've been a member of this uh, body of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, it took me five years to recognize that this lady next to me is actually my relative. <clears throat> she has a distinction of being the first chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors of Samoan ancestry, uh, and I'm very, very proud of her. So that being said, I uh, just want to let you know that uh, once a mayor, always a mayor. Uh, we're all about solutions, not about problems. Uh, we're all about best practices. We're all about ensuring that people know uh, that when it comes down to what Tip O'Neill said many years ago, all politics is local. We get it done. And I will not forget that as I go to the next level here and be the governor of the state of Hawaii. I hope that you will give the same courtesies and, and warmth that you've done with me, with my successor, uh, as well as the three other Hawaii mayors who I've asked to be a part of this. So we are probably one of the few states that has all the mayors of our state, <laughs> U.S. Conference of Mayors. <clears throat> So thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to be part of U.S. Conference of Mayors. I will not forget you and visit me anytime, not at City Hall now, at Washington Place, uh, where the next residents of the governor of the state of Hawaii. Aloha. We're going to miss you, Mufi. So, but we know that we have an ally in the governor's office. It is now my great pleasure to welcome back to the Conference of Mayors, Ron Sims, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary Sims served as the executive for King County, Washington, the 13th largest county in the nation. As HUD's second in command, he is responsible for managing the department day-to-day -day operations, a nearly $40 billion annual operating budget, and the agency's 8,500 employees. Deputy Secretary Sims has been at the forefront of the development of the new national policy to create sustainable communities, a program that involves HUD, the Department of Transportation, and the Environmental Protection Agency. He understands the strength of America's metro economies and is working to help reduce federal silos and promote smart job creating policies. That is why it is so appropriate for him to be with us this morning during our mayor's and business community breakfast. Please welcome HUD De Deputy Secretary Ron Sims. It's great to be here this morning, and uh, I need to, uh, there are a number of people, who, Wellington, who I've known for a, a long, long time, and we did a lot of work when I was the county executive, and the mayors and the large urban counties were working very well together, so thank you for your leadership, thank you for your friendship over all of these years. The um, Mayor Daly is always good hearing you and listening to you. You're thoughtful and provocative, and uh, thank you for your leadership in Chicago, Illinois, and throughout this country. I want to acknowledge uh, some HUD staff that are here. Uh, we have Jerry Hyden, who is the director of the Oklahoma City office, and our newly appointed uh, regional director for the southwestern United States, including New Orleans, uh, uh, Donald Babers. The, um, I've seen some friends here who are National Urban Fellows, and I just got to give them a shout out. The National Urban Fellows program is an incredible program. We had many of the National Urban Fellows in King County, and we ended up, have, now I get to call them up and ask for money. So the, uh, I, it is good seeing uh, many of those National Urban Fellows. Um, Mayor Hunneman, uh, it is really good seeing you again, and uh, mahalo, aloha. The, um, I want to say that HUD is no longer a housing agency, it's a development agency. 
We have been always talking about housing and our silos, and we never ever connected it to anything else. And when I was the county executive, of which people say to me, wow, you know, don't you miss being county executive? And I said, I miss the staff. I miss the, the range of issues. I, I wish I missed the daily excitement, the problems that occurred between midnight and 8, 8 to noon, noon to the end of the day, you know, trying, as I always describe my job, as landing planes. They're out of fuel. They're in the middle of the storm, and they're on a glide path, and we've got to get them all down safely because there's 10 more behind them. I m- miss that. I don't miss sitting with my beautiful wife at a restaurant and having somebody say, Executive Sims, I know this is your private time, (laughs) but I do not miss that at all. I do not miss waking up in the morning and having an editorial writer tell me how to do my job. I don't. And I love a good night's sleep without waking up and saying, why did one of my staff tell me that this was going to be in the paper today? It is not my problem anymore, but I love the staff I get to work with at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We are going to free them. We are going to be innovative and imaginative. We're going to take risks because society demands that a government take risks. So let me tell you how that's going to look on the sustainability and livability side. On sustainability and livability to me, it's very, very, very simple. People always said, how did King County, how did we create an environment of sustainability and livability? How did we, why were we noted for that? And it was really simple. Bill Gates, Paul Allen, Howard Schultz, and Jeff Bezos. Amazon.com, Starbucks, Microsoft, and Wealth. And the reason why it was important is we wanted to compete. This is the most competitive century in the history of the world. Microsoft could relocate tomorrow. And they were really clear that because of global competition, they could locate tomorrow. Bill Case used to say, I know I came here because my dad raised the financing, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was how they were going to grow, where was the innovation going to go, and whether they're going to keep their presence in our county. And he said, there are things that the people I hire want, strong schools. They want really workable neighborhoods. They want parks. They want arts. They want to know that they they want clean water and they want clean air. And they wanted the preservation of large areas of King County that were in forest. They did not want to see neon signs there. They wanted the ability to hike and bike and run in places that they felt would not only enable their health, but actually grow out. They wanted to be a sense of freedom as they worked. And that's how we organized King County. We decided that jurisdictional issues were always in the way, that you couldn't solve a problem. Clean air or dirty air does not stop at a city line. Never has, never will. That dirty water or water that is untreated does not stop at a city line. Never has and never will. Poverty and homelessness and crime never ever stops at a city line. It is the entire metropolitan area that has to function. And so what we did is said we were going to, because we were had a growth management law that helped us a lot, is to be able to say there's going to be an urban rural line. No more suburb. That was a mythology. We said you were urban or you were rural, you were ag or you were resource. And that we grew out our county with that kind of vision. So when I came to HUD, I said you guys were never an ally of that vision. I could never get USDOT and HUD to agree on anything. You know, they would build over here, and we would build over there, and it was never harmonized. We couldn't get EPA to agree on our methodologies of looking at it a, a metropolitan function rather than a local enforcement action. And our goal was to say no more. The federal government needed to speak with a single voice and be very clear, very clear about its policies. Rural linkages, 
People keep thinking about King County as being all metropolitan. There are 1.8 billion people, eight million people there. There are, it is, it is a wealthy county, and it is urban only in the cities, but we have large rural areas. And what is a rural linkage? And how do rural communities integrate into a metropolitan area? So the things that I learned when I was on the ground are the things that I have been telling people in HUD that we have to go. And Secretary Sean Donovan has been nothing less than spectacular. He has grabbed the housing and development issues with a vigor. He has created an environment in which we can take risk and move forward. Over the next several weeks, you will see things that I can't announce because we're in the cone of silence period, and it's a federal offense for me to tell you these things. But I can tell you what you're going to be looking at. You're going to see a partnership come out that has not occurred before. We call them supernofas that involve more than one agency because our goal is to say, you know, hold a second, we're going to send a signal that it isn't going to be a memorandum of understanding that we're going to operate by, it is a fusion of interest that we're going to operate by. And you will see that. You will see over the next several whatevers a grant on sustainability. And that grant will say to us, well, here's what we're going to look for. Every time we had a series of hearings we went out and made a decision, well, you know, why don't we ask people before we write the NOFA? And everybody said, no, no, you don't do that in the federal government. I said, no, we are going to ask first, how, what should it look like, and then we will write it. And trust me, that was one of the best things that ever happened, 9,000 pages of comments. And I always say, you know, Lord answered a lot of people's prayers, because had we written it, before we heard back, it would have been a much different notice. But here's what we heard. People say, people approached the federal government and the people who were homeless organizations said they never talked to us. Because nobody ever thinks that people who are homeless have a, and advocates have a role in metropolitan visions and growth. And we said, you know, how could somebody say that? This is the 21st century, we all know there's homelessness. And the only way to make homelessness a word of our past is a regional coordination of its effort. Then we have people who, of color, represented organizations of color, say nobody ever talks to us. All the grants go to Washington, D.C., and nobody ever, ever talks to us. We are a byproduct. People will enunciate there are problems of people of color, but nobody ever talks to us and listens to us. He said, well, we should do that. Then the school said, well, you know, you're going to have a metropolitan vision. Does anybody want to talk about schools? Then the universities came in and said, we're still there, and I know that people love us, but what about our intellectual capacities? What about the number of students go? What about our alumni? The environmentalists said, you know, only on environmental issues do people talk about metropolitan issues and rural linkages. Only on environmental issues, but not on the visioning of those. So our grants are going to make it very, very clear. We want a metropolitan-wide approach in some areas. We're going to want rural linkages for some other communities. We're going to want rural sustainability on other communities because we're not going to, not one size will not fit all. But we're going to look at those grants and the reviewers of those grants are going to be EPA staff, HUD staff, and USDOT staff. When their grants come out, the reviewers of those grants will be EPA staff, HUD staff, and USDOT staff. On the rural side, it'll be EPA, USDOT, HUD, and uh, EPA. The idea is that we're going to formalize the review so when the grants come in, they will be reviewed by a multiple number of staff from different cabinet agencies, and when the grants are awarded, it's going to be that way. And that's what happened to the Tiger Grant. Why sustainability? I always think in terms of my granddaughter. She's perfect. She's seven. I love her much. She comes to my, my son says to me, the worst experience in his life is when she goes, I let her go back home. Because she says, well, Grandpa Pa says I can have that. Grandpa Pa, and I said to him, yeah. He said, don't you ever tell her no. I said, no, I told you guys no. I am never going to tell my granddaughter no. <laughs> in 23 years, my granddaughter will be 30 years old. And I hope when she gets to be 32, if she decides to get married at 32 or older, that <laughs> it is her world that we have to look at. And here's why we talk about sustainability. The United States cannot sustain the repair and maintenance and new construction of sprawl. It's impossible. There are not enough, there's not enough money in the world. 
It cannot do that. And so our issue is we have to grow smarter. Cities have got to work, and we've got to make sure that we're coordinating our investments so that we can be the catalyst. I agree with Mayor Daley. Jobs are created by the business community, but I can assure you that Paul Allen would have never developed South Lake Union without having the support of the city of Seattle, the state of Washington, and King County in terms of infrastructure. And he created a lot of jobs. Government can be what I always call the job job, the, the base on which people can actually grow out their businesses. And that's what I believe our role is. And so sustain, when we talk about sustainability and I talk about how we're going to grow out those jobs, it is the ability of government to be smarter and more focused and make sure we are your partner so that you can partner with the business community to do things. But we can no longer afford the cost of sprawl. We can no longer afford the cost of poverty. We can no longer afford it. We know today, and in King County, we did the study. We could predict Lifetime earnings of children by zip code. We could t- determine morbidity rates by zip code. We could determine your illnesses by zip code. Rates of tooth decay for children by zip code. How you were going to get medical treatment by zip code. And everybody said, oh, you guys just fashioned a tool particular to King County. And we said no, because PBS took that very tool, applied it to Modesto, California, and got the same data elements and runs. It was applied in a six-county area in the Portland metropolitan area, and they got the same data. And HUD says, and our grants are going to say, that a zip code will be an address, but it will not be a life determinant anymore. It cannot be. We can no longer afford the concentrations of poverty that we're seeing. So we're going to say, what are you going to do about those concentrations of poverty? We can't afford it. We've created an entire infrastructure to support it all well-meaning and all noble and all really expensive. And we have more poor people. We have, in King County, we've gone from, in just in that support, we have gone from 50% home ownership of African Americans and 48% two-parent households in 1970 to 32% home ownership in 2006 and 28% two-parent households. We can no longer afford to maintain the status quo. It isn't working, and we have to move boldly forward as we never have before. And we're going to ask you to look at that in your grants. Look at a metropolitan approach. Talk about equity and justice. Talk about opportunity. Talk about the new things you would like to do to resolve issues of poverty and concentration, having stronger schools, having clean air, and having clean water. And the federal government's going to put its money where its mouth is. We're not going to dictate to you. We're going to simply say, here are the things that we want to see. And we want to see whether you formed a coalition to, in order to get it done. I always talk about my, I have three sons, Douglas, who is 32, Del, Daniel, who is 30, and Aaron, the last, the pleasant surprise, but the last one, he's 22. Douglas was the one that was most active. He's a librarian. I'm still stunned to this day because he didn't read books. But the... Um, <laughs> But what Douglas did is he volunteered me to climb Mount Rainier. That's 14,300 feet above sea level. You're taking in one-third less oxygen than you're taking in right now. And I remember getting that letter, and I said to my wife, look what the sadist did to me this time. (laughs) I went to the first meeting because I had convinced myself it was going to be base camp cook. I went to that first parent meeting. It's Mr. Sims, you're on rope team number four. My life passed before me. I went to my doctor the next day, unscheduled, until he saw me. I said, Doc, you're going to make the most important medical decision you've ever made for me. I want to know after 21 years, are we Mike and Ron? Are we doctor patient? You have no idea how important your answer's going to be. He said, well, I'd hope after 21 years, we're Mike and Ron. I said, Mike, I need a medical reason not to climb Mount Rainier. The... uh, (laughs) He said, friends don't tell friends to lie. Young women do not want to climb with young men. Young women said that young men are obnoxious, careless, they have no sense of risk, and they will lead us into every crevasse on the side of the mountain. Young men said young women are just too weak. And where are they going to go to the bathroom? And young people said to people like me, oh, too old. There are things in life that are meant to define us that we are 
tiny part of something extraordinary and magnificent, and Mount Rainier is a reminder. You ever have clouds flirt with you, dance for you, kiss you on the cheek and scoot away, play hide and seek, or to breathe air that is so fresh and so clean, so cold, so sweet, it fills body and soul. Or to look at a distant horizon that never ends and watch the sun say goodnight. Or to lay on a glacier and touch any star you wanted. I was on a rope team with three young women. They said to me, Mr. Sims, are you ready? I said, yes, and they pulled me right up the mountain. Because young women fly up mountains, they don't climb up mountains. <laughs> young men can handle heavier loads, and people my age know that mountains in life literally and figuratively are conquered one step at a time. But the lesson off that mountain is that everybody counts on a rope team. Everybody counts. Everybody counts. You move as fast as the slowest member, and you're as strong as the weakest member. Everybody counts. And what sustainability tells us, we're going to look at those applications and determine how strong that rope team is. Are you dealing with the strong and the weak, the fast and the slow? And we as a, only want to be your partner. We want to be on your rope teams as mayors. We want to be a part of that. But we're going to look for that message because that is the message of the future. My granddaughter's quality of life Life is going to depend on us being smarter and more innovative than ever before and learning how to provide opportunity. I understand that we're not, as a government, competing against China. I totally understand that. But tell me, they have far more intellectual talent to put into play. And the issue now in a newspaper story, and the greatest country ever created so far in the history of humankind, we are the world's grand experiment. No country has ever emerged as a superpower faster than us. No country has ever been able to be a military and economic world power without a common gene pool. We are humankind and history's grand experiment. All of us got here by boat, plane, and land bridge. And so for that generation of my granddaughter, I want her to be competitive. I want her to make a decision about whether she's going to have to use her tax money to pay for her granddad's not being smart and allowing sprawl to occur. I want her to be able to invest it in those things that she needs for her and her children to compete. I don't need her looking at deferred maintenance on wastewater. I don't need for her to say, I wish they had saved that park. I wish they had invested in that arts. It requires us and the sustainability to think not just what's going to happen over the next four years, but the, and not the next three generations, but as my mother's heritage would say, the next seven generations. That's what sustainability and livability is. It's an issue if you're a conservative of how much money do you want to spend and how much money you think is going to be available. Now, my sons, who are Douglas and Daniel and Aaron, are thoughtfully critical, who keep saying to me, Dad, you guys wrote a, a you, you use that credit card a lot. I said to them, oh, yeah, you know, hold a second. I was trying to ensure your quality of life. They said, no, no, Dad, you guys use that credit card a lot. And our real issue is having sustainability to be our way of spending money smarter, making more prudent investments, and not passing on a lot of new credit card debt to a future generation. That's what sustainability is. That's why the president wants it. That's why HUD wants it. That's why USDOT wants it. That's why USDA wants it. That's why the Department of Education wants it. That's why the Department of Labor wants it. That's why the National, Environment, National Endowment for the Arts finally said to us, hold a second. We know everybody needs arts. We just never Never thought about our role. That's why the CDC says, hold a second, if you can predict health care outcomes by the neighborhood and house that people live in, then they're going to start telling people, if you live in this kind of house, you're going to get sick. And if you're in this kind of neighborhood, you're going to get sick. Rather than tell people you're obese and have diabetes and heart disease, the cause isn't going to be smoking and the cause isn't going to be overeating. It's going to be, what kind of neighborhood did you live in? And those are the new measurements and metrics we're going to look at because the built environment has been too defining. So in the sustainability initiative, we're going to ask, have you thought all of that through? What are your tools? If you don't have them, you'll see another grant that goes out and says, we will help you then find those tools. 
But sustainability and livability has to be our future because that's how a nation like ours will compete for the rest of the 21st century. And in closing, we have an issue. My parents were demonstrators. I remember as a kid, opportunities were very diminished in my community. People used any phrase to describe me or my parents. There were rules of conduct based upon race. My parents, I remember one day saying to my parents, my teacher said to them, my parents were the alternating presidents of the NAACP for 17 years and the alternating presidents of the American for Democratic Action for 17 years in a community that had a sign at one point saying, welcome to John Birch Country, and then when you left, thank you for visiting John Birch Country. It was not the most politically correct parent, parent I had. So I was sent home to tell my parents to behave. So I walked in, I said, Daddy, my teacher told you guys to behave. My father said, toots, time for another demonstration. <laughs> the first time I ever got spat upon was I holding a sign walking down the street to demand that the Bar Marche hire African Americans as salespeople. Salespeople. Because the policy was that people who were white would not take change from a person's black hand. And I remember going down the street just asking for that. But that became a threshold for that community. My parents were able all of a sudden to use that as the leverage and lightning rod as people protested and spit on their kids and threw signs at us and called us a lot of bad names for the ugliness of a community to appear and people stand back and say, hold it, that is not us. It became catalytic for change. We have a program called TARP, Transformation of Rental Assistance. It is catalytic because it simply says that we're going to give poor people 4.5 million of them who now get rental assistance, we're going to free them up to rent in the neighborhoods they wish to live in. And we have an infrastructure pushing back saying, no, 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 what does that mean for us? Well, I really don't care. Because when you've been poor and I have seen it, you have a, this great country must be able to say, no, we're going to give people choice, no matter whether they're affluent or whether they're poor, but they're going to have that voucher and move with them, and that will change markets. It will change conditions. It will allow people to move into good school districts. It will allow people to move out of bad neighborhoods. And the people say, well, no, we can fix the bad neighborhood. Fine, fix it, and they'll move back. But we're going to give people choice. And that's up to you, because I can tell you we're in this debate, and everybody says, no, no, it's too early. It's not the time. Well, my parents demonstrated, they said it was not the time. It is the time for poor, poor people not to be captive of institutions and politics, but to be able to exercise their ability to choose so they can alter the conditions of their lives and their children. That's what we should be doing. And that's what we're going to ask you as mayors to work with us on, because people need that choice, need that choice. What we know is everything up to now has not worked well. Brandeis University came off the report last week and said, at the end of this recession, people of color will be the first time in the history of America where we have solidified income differences by race. The current institute came out and said that we have decided to make sure that poverty remains permanent. Well, you know, you can accept that, or we can call you can change the way things work by rearranging the deck chairs. And that's what TARP will do. It doesn't look great, but it's like my parents when they demonstrated. It'll be the first time when we say we got to do it differently. And yes, it's not going to be easy, and it isn't the final solution, but we must start. My oldest, I can remember a person named Hercules Johnson. Hercules Johnson, my father taught me when, Bud, never think you're so important that you will not shake another person's hand or hug them. So Hercules Johnson came to a fundraiser that was not mine. But I could just tell he was coming to me. 
I could just tell, and he had the whole day on him. He was covered by something from the top of his head to his feet. And he was walking right to me. And I said, no, I don't even have Perel. And he walked up. He said, are you Ron Sims? I said, yes. And he put out his hand. I put it out. And then I hugged him. And then he said, is your brother Jim Sims? I said, yes. And he said, well, tell your brother Jim that he saved my life by giving me one. I said, he did. He said, yeah, I am, was developing disabled and am developing disabled. But your brother, before anybody else thought about it, said I could live independently. Nobody believed but your brother that I could do that. And I have been living independently and going to work since 1994. I pay my rent. I catch my bus. Tell him, thank you for giving me a life. So I went to my brother. I said, James, James, do you know Hercules Johnson? You do not forget the name Hercules. <laughs> so he laughed. I said, Hercules said, thank you for giving him a life, saving his life by giving him one. The day before, there were three questions written on an ink board. Three questions on an ink board. And my oldest brother looked at me and said, I'm going to die, aren't I? I said, James, you will die. There's something you want to tell your sibling, your oldest brother, but that is not one of the things you want to tell him. He had a metastasized cancer. The issue was limited treatment. The certainty of his death was absolute. My brother's journey is complete. His life was full and rich and magnificent. But a higher authority than anybody in this room has determined that you have a job to do. That you've been given one more day, one more week, one more month, one more year, one more career in the toughest job in the United States being a mayor and working for cities counties, because I'm a county official too, so we conclude ourselves. Tough jobs. You're not in it for the money. You're in it for purpose, to improve lives. You've been given one more day, one more week, one more lifetime. Will you take that gift and hide it? Will you retreat? Or will you be like my parents, who said time for one more demonstration, one more boat action, one more seed change. So dream for my granddaughter, please, and your grandchildren. Dream for America that is the world's grand experiment and may it endure for the rest of the century. May we be sustainable, livable, a people at peace with ourselves. May we continue to be the most extraordinary nation in the history of humankind. Peace and prosperity, thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Ron. Here's our partner, everybody. And uh, we appreciate your inspirational words. We appreciate your partnership. And we appreciate the vision and the strategies that we will form together to move forward and make sure that your daughter and granddaughter and our daughters and sons and grandchildren will have that vision for their future. All of us together, we can do it. Thank you. Before we conclude, let me recognize another member of our leadership who is leaving office this year. After being elected mayor in 2002, David Cicilline strengthened city government and ushered in $3 billion in new investment to the city of Providence. At the Conference of Mayors, David has served as chair of the Children, Health, and Human Service Committee and is a member of the advisory board. He has been a fierce advocate on behalf of children and the arts. 
and last year, under very difficult circumstances, Mayor Cicilline did a fantastic job hosting our annual conference. We stood with you, Mayor, and we had a fabulous conference in, in Providence. On February 13th, David announced his candidacy for the U.S. House of Representatives. So you see, mayors and business um, leaders, we will have another friend in Congress. Our loss is Congress gain, but I believe our gain as well. Mayor Cicilline is a friend who we will, we will miss, but I also know that when he ends up in Congress, he will be a great champion for America's cities and mayors. It is my pleasure to present to David Cicilline this plaque in recognition of his service to our organization and to the nation's mayors. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this recognition. I, I just want to say that um, this, the last eight years being mayor of the city of Providence has been the most extraordinary uh, job I have ever had in my life. And one of the great joys of this work has been my membership in the United States Conference of Mayors. Uh, I was very fortunate early on to join this organization, um, really because of the leadership of Tom Menino, who is a neighboring mayor. Um, but immediately made some of the best friendships I've had in my life. Um, I have learned tremendously from this organization. Uh, there's almost not a single thing that I did in the city of Providence that didn't have its beginning in a conversation with one of my brilliant colleagues from around the country or learning it as a be best practice here at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. The work of this organization has enriched my life tremendously, but more importantly, enriched the lives of the residents of my city, and I know cities all across this country. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Mayor Kautz for this recognition, the, the leadership of the conference, thank all of my colleagues who have been great friends to me. Uh, I want to acknowledge Tom Cochran and the staff of the U.S. Conference of Mayors who have been just extraordinary and supportive in every way. Uh, Crystal, particularly in my committee, Tom, but everyone uh, welcomed me from the first day I joined this organization. Um, I promise you this, if I have the privilege of serving in the Congress of the United States, I will never forget the value and the work of mayors, and there will never be a person in that body that will be a stronger voice for America's cities and America's mayors. Thank you very much. To Jerry Powell and uh, for staffing and making uh, this organization strong through our business council, thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, Ed Summers, for all of the work that you do. These are our staff members who are the engine that makes us run, uh, along with Tom Cochran, that we continue to recognize because, as Mufi said, he is the glue that holds us all together. And, ladies and gentlemen, we will adjourn our uh, breakfast and we will move on to the opening plenary session promptly at 9.30. See you there.